Charlie, I, I know on the minds of, of these uh, freedom-loving people tonight is the election. We were talking uh, tonight before about some of the things that are going on and, and what you were sharing and I was listening, I, I found encouraging. Talk about this upcoming election, how important this is, how critical this is, and what the church can be doing to make a difference so, well, you know, so that this doesn't happen again. We got we to gotta do something. I love the question. And so I'm going to start unusually. I, I want to make sure that we all make a commitment that if this election doesn't go our way, the next day we fight. That's a very important thing. And I, I, I know I, I get golf applause because a lot of people don't want to hear that. They say, what do you mean it doesn't go our way? It has to go our way. We have to win. I, I agree. But if, if your answer is no, I'm not going to fight if I don't get my way, then you are a summer Sunny, what they called in the, the Sunshine Patriot, uh, not ready for the winter storm. And there were a lot of people, by the way, that were all on board for the American Revolution as long as it was 73 degrees and sunny. And as soon as they had to march through the, uh, the winter and fight a smallpox epidemic, they said, forget this, you know, mm. liberty sounds nice, but I, I like I the King George a lot. So they kind of got out of the way. So you have to commit yourself to that. Hello, my friends. I'm Nathan Leal. The website is Watchman's Cry. Dot com. And you just saw another clip to reveal their plan, Christian nationalism, which is their version of the world where dictators rule with iron. And you heard what he said. It was a call to arms. Charlie Kirk, the anti-Semite bigot, speaks as if he is acquainted with Jesus. And sadly, most of the folks in the church believed him. They believed his lies because apparently they've acquired a taste for the secondhand orc spittle. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm continually amazed at the blindness and biblical ignorance of these people. Biblical illiteracy is at pandemic levels, which was prophesied, and 40 years ago I read it. I knew it was in there, but to know about it and then to witness it is it's astonishing. Because I know what it means, and I know where it's headed, and I know where they are headed. And if they don't turn back and repent and denounce it, the Bible tells us about their retirement plan. Because they had no love for the truth that they should believe the lie. And then that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I find it amazing that he openly spoke in a church. He openly spoke of killing other Americans who didn't pull the correct lever to vote his way. And then to hear him put a guilt trip on the audience because they may not feel like shooting their neighbor the day after the election. This is madness. But this is their plan to overthrow the United States of America and burn the USA to the ground. And depending on the day of the week, there are countless Seven Mountain voices spewing out the same exorcist-flavored Antichrist demon bile. Because that's what it is. We are in the end times. We're watching Bible prophecy happen before our eyes. The horsemen have been loosened. Pestilence is riding, war is riding, famine, death, and all of those things that the horsemen are going to bring to the earth. And they're going out hunting for people whose names they're going to put on a tombstone. So right now in these end times, we have two choices. The first choice is to get soul nourishment from Jesus and the bread of life from heaven, from God. Or there's another choice. Another choice that seems to be the most popular that the majority of the church is grabbing and the second choice is to snort orange-tinted powder presented in front of your nose, Satan's cocaine. In this ministry, I am bringing a warning, and I have to do this. I know some people say, Nathan, enough already. But I can't stop, ladies and gentlemen, because souls are at stake. His word tells us these things that would come. It tells us and gives us the forecast and the predictions and the prophecies of what we have to look for. And we see it before our eyes. It's been in the Bible. It's been in there for 2,000 years and the church read about it and now it's here. The great apostasy, the great falling away, the great infiltration of the seven mountain MAGA madness from Satan's monastery. It's a mess, folks. It's a mess that people who used to study the Bible have become sweat hogs and misfits with the scripture. And it makes me sad because a lot of my ex-colleagues have gone down the, the road to confusion and as I watch this theological blunder of the ages, it's grievous. What can I do about it? I can say something. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to say something. I have a message. By the time we get to the end, 
It's going to answer a lot of questions about the end times. It's going to fill in the blanks, fill in the gaps, and explain why these things must be. Why do we have to have a lot of these scary things that are in Revelation? Why are these events going to happen? Why does God allow these events to happen? What is the purpose? There is a purpose, folks. And we're going to look into the scriptures, and I'm going to share something in there that affects everybody. It affects you. It affects your loved ones. If you're a Christian, it affects you. If your spouse is a Christian, your kids, your parents, it affects them. This information is going to affect everybody, but especially members of the body of Christ, because it is a make or break type of situation. And if the body of Christ does not get a hold of this, if they don't understand this information, then they're going to be lost. But let me explain. The tribulation period is here now, folks. A lot of people don't know it. They can't see it because the church has been programmed to expect other events. But those events aren't happening and a lot of them are not going to happen or they're going to happen in a way that was not foreseen. As a Christian in the end times, it is the responsibility of every one of us. This means you, my friend. It is your responsibility to make sure that you understand end time events, how things are going to happen and how they involve you and your family and your loved ones. So that's what this message is about. This is part six of this series. I would say out of all of them, this is a very, very important one. It's very important because it has to do with our salvation. The end time season of the tribulation period, the things that are going to happen and that are happening have a reason behind it. In summary, let me just say this. The reason for the tribulation period is to allow the church to go into a tailspin. A tailspin, folks. Nathan, what do you mean? God is going to allow the church to be rattled. And then while it is dizzy, test it to see if the church can find her coordinates and to find out who's going to vomit and who's going to eat the vomit. Just like Charlie Kirk, who shared his chunky porridge, his stew, his soup, with the church that was listening to him there in the audience, he was basically telling them that the day after the November election, they have to go out and start a revolution and be a part of civil war. That's what he's offering them. So he's acting like Esau, offering some soup for their inheritance in exchange for their position with God. That's how serious this is, folks. He's offering vomit to the people. He's offering rotten food with maggots in it. And while some of you are gasping and grimacing at this menu, the Bible confirms it. It tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. It also says that judgment begins in the house of God. However, since the church has been brainwashed into believing that we're not going to be here, that has worked in Satan's favor. Because the test of the end times and the test of the tribulation period that we are now in is finding a lot of Christians who don't understand the timeline, they don't understand the scriptures, and they don't even understand what time it is. They don't get it. And because of that, we're also seeing something else happen, which the Bible predicted. It tells us that in the end, we would see a man competing for position in the hearts of God's people. That's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am up here on this wall, and as I look toward the horizon, I can see a red train coming with a wall of fire trailing behind it. Trump is bringing fire. And as he dangles trinkets and charms, he's a master schemer of dark sentences, and he's a master deceiver. And he also possesses a name that is known by Apollyon, and a soul that is known by Legion and his I Am Battalion. Nathan, that offends me. Don't say that about Trump. You're mean. You don't care. Folks, we're talking about the Antichrist. Do you know what that means? We're talking about a guy who's going to kill millions of people. We're talking about a guy who's going to be responsible for taking a lot of people to hell with him. We're talking about a guy who thinks he's a messiah. A few folks can see it. I can see it. And it's too bad that more people do not see that he's an arrogant abomination who is against every one of you, including his political loyalists and the folks out there who act as his back scratchers and scullery mates who serve him the heads of his enemies on a platter. Because that's what he likes to do. He likes to get revenge. And then he likes to pull other people that surround him into the same darkness of revenge. But still... The MAGA minions of confusion and the bench warmers sitting next to them have a belief that he will never leave them or forsake them. He's the man of sin, folks. He's the canker sore of the end times. And he's going to be used by God to prune the church and eliminate 
the Paxnifian phonies and Pharisees and hypocrites and betrayers and, and the ones who like being shackled by Mr. Phony Baloney. And yes, it's true. I have passion. How can you not have passion? How can a person not have passion about the madness and the delirium and the, the rape and the molestation that is happening to God's people right now by the devil who is using this man? You know, folks, I'm astounded because I keep wondering and wondering to myself, where are the voices behind the pulpits who will condemn his madness? Where are they? Where are the Elijahs of God who will speak with the fire of heaven and the power of the Holy Ghost to tell the world that Satan's spawn has invaded the sanctuary? Where are they? Where are they? I'm waiting to see them, but they're not showing up. Where are the voices of the called out ones who will speak out against the man of sin, Donald Littlehorn, Trump, the Antichrist, the son of destruction, the child of perdition, the stealer of men's souls? the destroyer of virtue, the dispenser of celestial poison, the vendor of sorcery. Where are they? Where are the people that will say with boldness that he's a merchant of blood poison and a mortician for MAGA and is walking dead? Where are they, folks? Where are the brave ones and the unashamed ones? Where are the ones that aren't afraid because they would rather serve God rather than men? Where are the ones that are willing to cry out that the kingdom of the real mountain is coming and it's going to crush the seven mountains down to powder? And my friends, God is looking for those who understand that speaking the truth is not for cowards or for the double-minded. God is looking for bold ones. He's looking for people who will not fold when MAGA comes knocking at your door. It's going to bang on everyone's door and it's doing it right now. It's banging on the doors of Christians with its seven mountain lie that looks like a woman with the forehead of a whore. Maga is a prostitute from Satan's chicken ranch who has the forehead of a whore. And I have the Bible to prove it. And if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, if Jesus lives inside your heart, you need to have this information and you need to get a hold of it. The entire body of Christ needs to get a hold of what I'm saying today because our reservation with Jesus depends on it. That's right, folks. The Bible explains it all, and I'm going to share it. Get your Bible and take notes because I need to explain it. And I know I'm getting fired up because I would just rather be preaching right now. I would rather breathe fire and kindle a few coals inside of those hibernating. But I also need to explain this information because God has instructed me to do it. Now, as a backstory, I just want to share this real quick. Allison and I study the Bible together. We study the end times together. We study Revelation together and we'll discuss things and ponder it. We'll meditate on it. A few weekends ago, we were studying and Allison had a eureka moment. So I want to share it with you. She told me, she goes, I realize something right now and I want to run it by you and tell me what you think. So I said, okay, what do you got? And the thing that she shared blew me away. It just made too much sense. It was God revealing to her. So she shared it with me and then I took it. And began digging even further. And then I added to it. And that's what I'm going to share today with you. In summary, this is what she heard. She heard from the Holy Spirit that in the end times in the book of Revelation, what we're actually looking at when we see some of the cast of characters, she heard that the bride is in competition with the harlot of Mystery Babylon, the harlot. And she said that she goes, the bride is in competition with the harlot or the harlot is in competition with the bride. And it's basically two groups in the church. And when she said that, I suddenly saw it. And I said, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so let's look at it. So we started digging into it and we started dissecting it. And then we had to prove it with the summary of the Bible. In other words, if this concept was true, if this was a true biblical idea from God, then we would have to expect that we could confirm it with Scripture elsewhere in the Bible. So when I was digging, I was able to complete that thought. And now there's a a picture that has formed. And by seeing this picture, I want to share it with you guys. If you can see this picture, then it totally makes sense what we're watching right now with the MAGA movement, the radical madness, the dysfunction, the confusion, the delusion in the portion of the church versus the remnant who sees it. So We have two groups that are going on, two camps. 
and it has to do with the bride versus the great whore of Babylon. For those of you that were shocked at the comment I just made a moment ago, that's in the Bible, the forehead of a whore. That's in scripture, and I'm going to explain that in a moment. But as I began digging into this, it was amazing. It bore witness. I was able to find other verses and passages and scriptures, and then God started downloading even more, and it all came together. It explained the purpose for the tribulation and the purpose for the Antichrist and why all of the signs and why all the confusion or the fog of confusion. Why? This is what it is, folks. Let me give you a summary of the reason why God is allowing us to go through the tribulation period. By the way, if you're new to this ministry and to this channel, here at Watchman's Cry, I have proven already. We have discovered where the rapture is. The rapture is not pre, mid, or post-trib. There's no such thing, but rather it is pre-wrath. It occurs in the timeline before the bold judgments. So we can find the rapture in Revelation 14, 14, and then after that we have the wrath of God. I've done a very deep study on it on this channel. So if this is new information to you, please don't start arguing in the comments because we've already done all that. And most of the listeners here in this channel understand we're all up to speed on the same page. They understand also that the rapture happens before the wrath of God in Revelation chapter 14. So please don't type in there and start arguing or I'm just going to delete you. We're not going to argue about this. This is not an issue. It is not up for debate. We're not going to go there because it's a waste of time. And it's also responsible. It's responsible. The pre-tribulation rapture is what I'm talking about. That theory, that false theory is responsible for why so many people are following and worshiping Donald Trump. Because they have this idea that they're not going to be here to see the Antichrist. So therefore, Trump can't be him. Therefore, they can swoon over him and give him all the praise and love and, and worship and all that mess that I just mentioned. So back to what I was saying. What is the reason for the tribulation period? What's the reason for the Antichrist and the signs? Well, the purpose of the tribulation period is to be the final test for the church, for the bride. But not just a test. God is using it. Listen to this, folks. Hear me out. The other reason is so that God can finalize the list for the invitations to the wedding feast. So that he can know whose name goes in there and whose name doesn't go in there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the wedding feast is coming. And before the wedding feast, we are going to have the harpazio, the gathering, the snatching away, also known as the rapture, the harvest, the resurrection. It is coming. Jesus is going to meet us in the clouds and we're going to get glorified bodies. So that event is coming. But here's the problem. Most of the church is not ready. They're not even close to being ready. Why? Because they haven't been tested. And they haven't had a chance to prove what they believe. They haven't had a chance to prove their loyalty to Jesus. They haven't had a chance to prove that they are not easily swayed with deception. They have not had a chance to prove how bold they can be when it comes to God and the kingdom of God. The unseen things. They haven't had a chance to prove it. So the tribulation period is going to serve the opportunity for all of us to prove it. Now, folks, think about this. Think about what I'm saying right here. In the old way, the old, the old teaching, the theories, the philosophies and traditions of men, we have been told that the purpose of the tribulation is so there can be a lot of scary stuff that Hollywood can make movies about and everyone's all freaked out. Like doom and scary demons and scary Nephilim and meteors and the Roman catholic church making life miserable for everyone and the one world government coming to this world and putting everyone every one of us in persecution and lockdown just for the sake of it now i'm not saying that that's not going to happen but the characters that are going to be responsible for these things happening are not who we were told because we were told who the boogeyman was Hal Lindsey told us who the boogeyman was and so did the left behind books and all of the famous pre-tribulation teachers like John Hagee. We were told that it was the Catholic Church that was going to make a one world government and then bring about some kind of system to make us just serve the wrong God and then we're just persecuted and then we have to die for our faith. Which does sound scary. That sounds pretty bad. But the real test is not happening that way. There's a better reason that God has formulated. God has a smart reason. He has a genius reason. He has a reason as the potter. And we being the clay, his reason has to do with our refinement. It has to do with us becoming vessels of honor, tested to show our faithfulness, to show our loyalty. That's the reason for it, folks, so that we can be tested to show 
that not only are we willing to be martyrs for God, but also that we're also wise enough and hungry enough for his word that we will not allow ourselves to be deceived by the enemy. And you see, folks, that's the big test in these end times. It's about deception and choosing which team we're going to be on. Team Mystery Babylon Harlot or Team White Robes of the Church of the Bride. The Bible backs up what I'm saying. It's found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Right before Jesus gets on the horse and returns, it says, The marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Give glory to God because the marriage of the Lamb has come and she made herself ready. You see, with the pre-tribulation rapture theory, it's just you need to say the sinner's prayer and, and that's it. There's not a challenge for staying out of deception. There's not a challenge in the pre-tribulation teaching that we have to make ourselves soldiers that are vigilant, that are wise, and that can't be swayed with lies and false doctrine and damnable heresies like we see happening right now in the Seven Mountain movement that has taken over the world. This nationalistic movement that is blindsiding people and has them believing that they can be a part of something that sounds spiritual but is not even in the Bible. The Bible does not talk about the Seven Mountains and those categories. Those seven categories, the religion and media and entertainment and arts and all of those things. The Bible doesn't say that. But these people, Lance Wellnow and all these other clerics and sorcerers and liars, have taken this idea and made it sound like it's in, in the Bible and gospel, and it's not. But the reason they're getting away with it is because they've also brainwashed their people to believe that the words of prophecy and revelation in the end times pulls rank on the Bible. As a result, you have these flaky apostles and showmen and shamans for Satan that are lying to God's people and making stuff up. And the people believe it because there is a famine for the word of God and they didn't bother to check it out, to fact check it. So the test, ladies and gentlemen, has to do with truth and how we deal with it. It has to do with lies and how we deal with them. Are we measuring both of them with vigilance and diligence? Are we? Because that's the only way that we're going to fulfill and be a part of Revelation 19.7 that says the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. The bride made herself ready, ladies and gentlemen. That statement right there involves more than just saying the sinner's prayer. That is talking about going through some things and going through trials and going through refinement and through purging and development and transformation and renewing which takes effort because the rest of that verse says something else. It says the bride has made herself ready, ready. Now, when it says the bride has made herself ready, that word ready means prepared. If you look at the Greek word, it means prepared. It means to make the necessary preparations. So we have to apply effort to deny the lies, to reject the darkness, to reject ideas that are tempting, to reject peer pressure, from friends and from family and spiritual leaders who are trying to convince you that it's true. A lot of you folks are in that battle right now. Some of you are still wrestling with it because there's a lot of pressure on you to make you believe that Trump is some kind of David or Cyrus or Savior. He's the the one who's going to bring about a renewed America to get rid of all the nasty things. And see, that's the way that they're dangling the carrot. They are offering an earthly remedy so that Christians won't have to be tempted and work through their temptation. They are trying to create a world where people no longer have to do spiritual warfare and battle the darkness that's within them, to battle the shadows, the thoughts, those things that everyone through time has had to battle. But now, for some reason today, they want to get rid of, well, let me just say it. We can't have gay people tempting us or tempting our kids Because it makes a bad atmosphere and we can't have that. So let's just get rid of all the gays. In fact, let's burn down the old government that allows gays and LGBT and rainbow rights. They can marry each other and all that. Instead of having to see that and and deal with it and try to win them or deal with it and not be tempted by it. Let's just burn down the old America that allows it and rebuild a new America where we don't have to see it. Is that where the church is today? Because when we really think about it, what they're really saying is they're a bunch of pansy wimp when it comes to Christianity. They're not able to resist temptation. Folks, when the church was born, the first century church dealt with paganism and idols and statues to Apollo and Helios. The first century church 
had to actually deal with them. They had to deal with people who worshipped them. They had to deal with people who actually had those statues and idols in their own houses. The early church was birthed having to deal with paganism. And they prospered with the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of transformation. But today, there's a new thought. No, we don't want to have any of that because we don't want to be tempted. We would rather just have a clean place. And then after we get out our brooms and sweep away all the rainbow folks, after we sweep them away and put them somewhere, then Jesus is going to come back. And ladies and gentlemen, that has so many problems in so many ways, in so many areas. That is a powerless, toothless, sissified, pansy, fairy power religion. That's what that is. And is that what the Seven Mountain Church is really saying? They call themselves apostles and prophets and they operate by the Holy Ghost, but they're too sissified. They don't have the power of God like the first century church did. The first century church was torn apart by lions. The first century church had to endure persecution. They had to endure salvation at the expense and threat of death. But now here we have an end time revised seven mountain body of believers that has taken over a good portion of America and now even Europe and it's, it's going everywhere. Christian nationalism so that they don't have to deal with temptation. And that is not in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. That is a lie and it's not true. The real truth is that God wants to see the bride make herself ready with his strength, with his power. Because we can read in Revelation 13 that Satan was granted to make war with the saints and overcome them. Which saints are those? That means there's a portion of saints that he is being granted authority to overcome. There's a portion that he's going to overcome. The seven mountain movement of misfits and madness. Theological malpractice and biblical illiteracy. Those are the ones that are being overcome because they're not using the Bible. They are not rightly dividing the word. Instead, they're just making stuff up like Lance Wilnow did. And now you have a secondary church that has become a harlot with the mark of a whore on her forehead. Nathan, you keep saying that. I'm offended. Just hold on. If you keep watching this video, you're going to get offended more. If you don't have a grounding on the Word of God and you don't know what time it is, and if you're full of lies, if you've taken a bite out of the MAGA salt pork, then yeah, you're probably going to get offended even more. But if you want the truth, stick around. Because that's what we're doing here, folks. The real truth. The solid truth. The established truth. So the false church and the ones that aren't using the word are going to get overcome by Satan. Meanwhile, conversely, we have the other group that's mentioned in Scripture. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. They overcame him, the devil. Two groups. One group overcomes because they use the word and their testimony and the blood. They understand the power of the blood. But the others, why were they overcome? Because the word's not mentioned and the blood is not mentioned. Let me get back to what I was saying about this disclosure, this revelation, this rhema that God shared with both Allison and I about the bride and the harlot. It all lines up. It makes so much sense because... In Revelation 19.7, it says the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. And then in the next verse, open your Bible, Revelation 19.8. Look what it says. She made herself ready, the bride, and to her it was granted. It was allowed. It was issued. It was given. It was decided. It was granted her to be arrayed. That means to be clothed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts of of the saints. So because she made herself ready, then she was granted to wear the robe. So in other words, the robes were not just automatic. And the pre-tribulation teaching makes the church think that it's automatic, that the robes are automatic, the garments are automatic. You say the sinner's prayer 20 years ago, and boom, when the rapture happens, it's all good. It's going to be ready. But folks, that's not what the Bible says. We have to make ourselves ready. And the only way to do that is to go through the testing. I'm going to explain that now. If you have your Bibles, turn to the reference. Let's look at the reference of Mystery Babylon, the Great Harlot. And that's found in Revelation 17 and 18, two chapters. So if you have it, turn there, and we're going to look at some scriptures. I don't have time to read the entire two chapters, so that's your homework, my friends. Read Revelation 17 and 18 to get familiar 
because there's been a lot of confusion. Some people are saying it's the Catholic Church. No, it's not. It's not the Catholic Church or it's some kind of other creature. They still can't figure it out. I'm about to show you something and it's going to make it clear. And once you see it, you're never going to unsee it. I am hoping that it will stir the body of Christ, those of you listening, to want to dig even more in the scriptures and join us with even a deeper commitment to want to be a student of prophecy. Some folks aren't applying the effort like they should, but I'm hoping that this will challenge all of you to then dig even deeper than you have in the past. Okay, Revelation 17, 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and talked to me. And he said, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, that means red, on a red beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Look at this, folks. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Okay, now that was a lot. And based on where you are in your end time studies, based on the books you've read, based on the sermons you've listened to, based on the influence that you've experienced, Pretty much everybody has a certain opinion about who this is. There's a lot of opinions about it. But opinions don't really matter. Opinions mean nothing. What we need to do is get to the heart of the matter. And we need to be able to interpret who this is by using scripture and the witness of the Bible. So as it went on, the angel said, why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. So the angel is saying, I'm going to tell you who it is. I'll tell you who it is, the beast that carries her who has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition and those who dwell on the earth will marvel. Now verse 8 is telling us that the beast creature that the woman sits on, in other words, the end time beast, seven heads, ten horns, the one that's going to be all over the whole world. The angels told us that it's been around before. It used to be on earth, but then it went away. At the end of time, it's going to rise again at the very end of time. Which means, and I said this in the last program, but I'll say it again. There are some folks that say it's Rome, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church comes from Rome. And when John wrote this, Rome was the empire of the world at the time. When the angel says the beast that you saw was and is not right now, that means whoever this end time beast is, is not right now. So what that meant was the empire that John lived under was not the beast. Because it used to live, it was, but during John it was not. But then it's going to rise again and then go into perdition, which means destruction. So that means the beast that he saw is one of the creatures, the spiritual entities, principalities, very powerful entity that had been around in the past. Now, how do we find out who it had been in the past? We look elsewhere in the Bible. And when we go elsewhere in the Bible and go to the book of Daniel, we can see the vision of the four beasts that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel 8, we are told who the beast is of the end times. Because Daniel sees four different beasts and they come chronologically in succession. The first one was Babylon. That's who he was living under at the time. And then the next one to come was going to be Persia. And then after that... Greece, Alexander the Great, the Macedonians were going to come. That was number three. And then the end time beast was going to rise at the very end of time. Daniel tells us that that end time beast, the little horn comes out of the horn of Greece, Alexander the Great. It says that in Daniel 8. Greece is the key. Alexander the Great is the key, which means it is not Rome. So erase Rome from your head. It is not the Catholic Church or Rome, because that's who it was then at the time, Rome. And the Catholic Church came out of the Empire of Rome. Now we're eliminating. We are eliminating. So that means the end time beast that was and is going to come is the remnant of Alexander. Okay, let's move on. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was in the past, Alexander, and is not right now Rome, and yet is. It's going to come. He goes on, verse 9, 
Here is the mind which has wisdom. So now he's given us a clue. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Let's stop right there. This woman sits on seven mountains. Whatever this creature is, Mystery Babylon, is sitting on some kind of system or religion or belief or philosophy that involves seven mountains. Because all of this is symbolic. And right now, we're watching this happen in real time. The seven mountain movement is taking over America. It is taking over the government in Congress. It's in the Senate. It's in local government. It's in state government. It's everywhere, folks. Matt Gates, Lauren Bobard, Marjorie Taylor Greene, they are all seven mountains. Paula White, who was Trump's witch in the first administration, his cleric, he put her in charge of evangelism advisor. She follows the seven mountains. So the seven mountain movement is infecting America's government right now. That's what this series is about. I'm explaining, we're breaking it down so that we can understand how it's going to do this. So this woman is sitting on the religion of the seven mountains. So now let's talk about it. There's a lot of folks who were told that the woman was something. So they're looking for that something to happen or to appear. But ladies and gentlemen, if it's the wrong something, it's never going to happen. And as a result, those same people may find themselves being a part of the church of that woman. Now think about that. Think about what I just said. When it comes to Bible prophecy, we are warned by God that in the end times we would face adversaries and deceptions. But if the people do not know what those things are, there's a chance that they might become involved with him and not even know it. And in these end times, it is a matter of spiritual life and death that we do not become a part of those who defect away from God, whether it's by deception or blindness. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50 and 51, we see a shadow of this woman, Mystery Babylon. We can find this entity in other sections of the Bible. So we find it in Revelation 17 and 18. When you have a chance, please read the entire thing. And we can also find her in Jeremiah 50, 51, as well as Isaiah 47. Now, there are also other references, but those are some of the main ones. With those references, we have two or three witnesses to confirm and help us to decode and understand who Mystery Babylon is. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have your undivided attention for the remainder of this program. And I want to ask that you look up the passages that I'm going to give you. Or if you don't have access to a Bible right now, get a pen and paper and write it down or listen to this program again. But it is important, it's imperative that you find the scriptures yourself, that you look them up, and that you highlight them in your Bible. So when you go to Revelation 17 and 18, you can take your pen and highlighter and highlight the verses we're going to look at. And in the margin, you can also put references to the other passages that I mentioned, which is Jeremiah 50, 51, and Isaiah 47. So write that in your margin, and then when you have a chance, go read them. It'll take a while. There's a lot there, but that's what Bible study is about. And the only way that the true church of God and the bride are going to know the truth and know how to navigate is by being equipped with the correct knowledge of truth that only comes from God's Word. All right. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. I'm going to read several passages in Revelation, and we're going to look at the description of this woman. And we're going to find out who she is and who she thinks she is. And we're going to see how God describes her, because he describes her based on who she thinks she is. But then we're also going to look at who she really is. So in Revelation 17, it says, when it describes her in verse 4, 17, 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. And she had in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So this woman, whoever she is, has a cup of iniquity in her hand. Now that right there is a clue because the Bible tells us that there is a cup of iniquity for every nation on earth. It is stored in heaven and he has the cups of all the nations in heaven. He can see them. So here's how it works. Every nation on earth, every kingdom has a cup of iniquity. As they sin over time, that cup will have deposits of sinful wine, putrid, rotten vinegar, gall. And this cup is full of all the dregs and the garbage and the abominations. They're stored in that cup. And when a cup becomes full, then God judges them. But, but the volume that those cups can carry is something we can't comprehend. Because when God was talking to Abraham and talking to him about the promise... He said that your descendants are going to get the promised land, but not yet. And that's found in Genesis 15, 16. So please write that down or go there. I'll turn there in my Bible and 
And what we're doing is establishing biblical knowledge and truth. So in Genesis 15, verse 16, let's back up to verse 13. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. This was the prophecy about the children of Israel being in Egypt. When Moses would tell Pharaoh, let my people go, that was going to happen first. And that's what he's saying right here in verse 13. And then he goes on, and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. That happened in the Exodus. Verse 15, now for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What did that mean? That meant that when the time was ripe, the descendants of Abraham would then get to tap into the promise that God made. But it was not time yet because the Amorites who were dwelling there had not yet filled up their cup of iniquity. But when their cup of iniquity did get full, then God would use Israel to judge them. And when we look in scripture, that's how he's always done it. God looks at kingdoms and when their sin becomes unbearable because it is flowing over the top of their cup of iniquity, then he will send someone else to judge them. And if we look at empires that have come and gone over time, we can often see that. We can see that some empires, when they became very evil, they were conquered or they fell like the Mayans. And I know that some of the liberal folks out there don't want to hear this, but God used the conquerors, the conquistadors, to judge the human sacrifice that was happening in the new world. So make note, ladies and gentlemen, there is a cup of iniquity. Now in Psalms chapter 75, we have another reference to the cup of iniquity. Psalm 75 verse 8, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. Now, I have spoken about this passage a lot of times over the years of Watchman's Cry. And when we look at that word, the wine is red, that word red, if we look in the original Hebrew, means boiling. So the cup of iniquity eventually becomes full, and then it starts to boil, and it runs over the top. And then that's when God says, you're going to drink of this cup. He says it to the people, spiritually speaking, and then judgment happens. Okay, so now we have several references to the cup. So back to the woman in Revelation, and she had a, a cup in her hand. That's Revelation 17, verse 4. It says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, make note of those colors, and adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And in her hand there was a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Based on her having a cup in her hand, that tells us that she's a kingdom. Because we have that reference now that she represents people or a kingdom. Just like the Amorites referenced in Genesis. By the way, I didn't mention this, but God also told Jeremiah to give the cup of iniquity to several nations. And that happens in the later chapters of Jeremiah, where he says, go up to those kingdoms and tell them they're going to drink. And if they say we're not going to drink, you tell them you will certainly drink. So Jeremiah did that. So every nation has a cup. And since we see that this woman has a cup, that means she's a kingdom. You see, folks, we're using the Bible to isolate and decode this. Now, the other thing that we have to make note is that she had something written on her forehead. That she was Mystery Babylon. She felt she was great, but she's really the mother of harlots. Not just a harlot, but she's the mother of harlots. Now, what does that mean, to be the mother of harlots? We're going to use the Bible to decode that. But first, before we leave Revelation, because we're going to go into some other passages elsewhere, go to the next chapter, just turn a few pages, go down to verse 16. This chapter talks about the fall of whoever this entity is, Mystery Babylon. And based on what we read here, it talks about violence happening to her shores. It talks about the merchandise that she sells to the world. So this is an actual physical location that contains commerce and commodities and resources that it exports to the world. And in verse 15, it says, The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment and weeping and wailing, and they will say, verse 16, here it is, Alas, alas! That great city, there it is again, it's a city, it's a kingdom. In the Bible, often kingdoms are called cities or city-states. So it says, That great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, 
such great riches came to nothing. So make note, folks. What was she clothed in? Right here, we see three different colors. She's clothed in fine linen, so that's white. Purple, which is purple, and scarlet, which is a shade of red. And she also has gold and precious stones. So if you're taking notes, Mystery Babylon wears linen, purple, and scarlet, or white, purple, and red, and precious stones. Now, if we were to look elsewhere in the Bible and look for that combination, would we find that combination anywhere else? Yes, we would. And as we go to the source where those colors are found, this is going to bring everything together. And if you are a student of the Word and a student of Bible prophecy and you really want to get to the heart of this matter, get ready to be blown away, folks, because this is going to tell us everything. So here we go. When we look for those three combinations, we find them in the Old Testament when God called Moses up into the mountain. And he told Moses how to build the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 24, it says that when he went up into the mountain, the glory of God rested on Mount Sinai. The glory of the Lord. Glory, which is the power and the presence of God. The surrounding of God. God's cloud came down on Mount Sinai. Moses went up and spoke to him. And then God told him the instructions for everything, for the law. He gave him the law. And in order for Moses to do this, he was going to have to build the tabernacle. He was in charge of building it. God gave him the instructions. It's real interesting. When God told him about all the different parts of the tabernacle, which includes the tent, the material for the tent, and the doors of the tent, and the little hooks that the curtains would hang on, how to build the curtain for the Holy of Holies, the ark, how to carve them out, what decoration to put on them. God gave this information to Moses, but the reason he did that was because the tabernacle of the Old Testament for the children of Israel was a, a shadow of the tabernacle of God. The real temple of God would be something that God made with his hands, not human hands. But in the meantime, God was going to place his temple inside of our hearts when we got saved, when we were born again after Messiah came. But when God was talking to Moses, none of that had happened yet. So God was giving him a shadow of the things to come. Exodus chapter 28, verse 2, And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Did you hear that, folks? God said, you shall make holy garments. The high priest's garments, the robes and the ephod and everything, the tunic, everything. Glory and beauty. The priestly garments would represent the glory of God. When Moses went up into the mountain, Mount Sinai, it says God came down in glory. He surrounded the mountain in a cloud. So when God surrounds, it's his glory. And when he told Moses to make the holy garments for Aaron, he was saying the same thing, that it was a shadow of his presence, in other words. So Aaron was going to act as a high priest, which was a shadow of Jesus. It was a representation of Jesus. That, But in the meantime, he had to just do it in the earthly realm. So when those garments were made for Aaron, and when God says it's for glory and beauty, that means that he would be there with Aaron. He would be there with him. Now let's look at his clothing and what it looked like. Now stay with me, folks, because this is going to be awesome. When we go to verse 31, it says, You shall make the robe of the ephod for Aaron was to be made in all blue. Exodus 28, 31, the robe was all blue. And when we reference verse 2 that says Aaron's holy garments would be for glory and beauty, and then we consider that it's going to be all blue, what does that mean? That means that the color blue represents the presence of God. Okay, folks, you got that? But not only the presence of God, it represents several things. It represents the law of God, the holiness of God, Messiah. It represents Jesus. So in other words, the color blue represents Messiah, Jesus. And as we go on, Exodus 26.1. Write this down, folks. Exodus 26.1. When God describes the tabernacle that Moses was to build, he says, Take ten curtains of linen, blue, purple, and scarlet. Four colors, ladies and gentlemen, blue and also linen, purple, and scarlet. Now, when we look at the woman in Revelation, she had linen, purple, and scarlet, but she didn't have blue. Do you notice that, folks? She was missing blue. When we go to Exodus 26, 31, write that down. Remember the veil that was ripped in half from top to bottom when Jesus said, it is finished, and he died on the cross? The veil of the temple was split down the middle which meant that now instead of God dwelling in the Ark of the Covenant and in the Holy of Holies in a temple built with man, God would now go out into the world and he would dwell in our hearts. We would become the temple. 
That's why that happens. And that veil for the tabernacle is in Exodus 26, 31. And the color of the veil was blue, linen, purple, and scarlet. Same colors, folks. The same four colors, which include the same three colors of the whore of Babylon, who doesn't have blue. So again, the veil had those four colors. When we go to the screen of the tabernacle door, we have the same thing. That's in Exodus 26, 36, blue, scarlet, linen, and purple. When we look at the gate of the court, the same thing. When we look at the ephod of the high priest, it was to be made out of those same four colors, but it would also have gold mixed in. And that's in Exodus 28, 5 and 6. So the ephod for the high priest also had gold in it. Do you see the pattern here, folks? It goes on. God told them. In Numbers, now we're in the book of Numbers, in chapter 4. I'll give you a chance to go there. Are you there, folks? Or just write this down. Numbers chapter 4, verse 13. And God says, when you move the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, in other words, it's time to fold up the tent because it's time to move somewhere else. God was always moving them around in the desert. And God said, when it's time to move the Ark, you are to cover the Ark with lamb skins, goat skins, or badger skins, pelts, in other words, and then cover that with a blue cloth. A blue cloth. Aaron's robe was all blue which represented Jesus covering him. And now we have the Ark of the Covenant that was supposed to be covered with all blue because the Ark is the law of God. The Ark represents God himself. He was in there. He dwelled there. And it was supposed to be covered with the color of Jesus, blue. And this concept goes on. The table of showbread. Remember the showbread, the daily bread? Supposed to always be bread on top of that table. That represented, that was a shadow of Jesus. He's the bread of life. And when it came to the table of showbread, they were supposed to cover it with a blue cloth first and then put the bread. But it had a blue cloth first. The golden altar, same thing. They were supposed to cover it with blue. The lampstands, covered in blue. The utensils of service were in a blue cloth. So now what do we have? We have four colors that are mentioned for the tabernacle. Okay, so let's break down those colors. Blue represents God, His presence. Purple represents royalty. We know this because when Jesus was being mistreated, after Pilate said, send him off to be crucified, he sent them back to the Praetorian guard and made mockery over him. That's when they made the crown of thorns. It was the Roman soldiers doing it. And they put a purple robe on him and mocked them. So purple is royalty. Blue is the presence of God. White represents, well, that one's easy, folks. What is white? White is purity. It represents the garments our wedding garments that we will wear when we're in heaven. It means that we are spotless. And then we have red. Red represented two things. It represented sins, the sin of man. Isaiah says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. So red represents our sins, but also represents the blood of Jesus. So it's both. Our sins get covered with the blood. Can you see what we're looking at now? When we look at the tabernacle in the Old Testament, and then we look at the whore of Babylon, the picture is now clear that she is an imitation counterfeit of Christianity. She represents the false church as a legitimate entity. They believe, in other words, that they are pure. They believe that they have God's blessing. They believe that they know God, that God loves them, that God approves of everything they're doing. But she's missing the color blue. The land of scarlet, linen, and purple is missing Jesus, the color blue. So Mystery Babylon is a fraud. And by the way, she is a nation also. She's a nation because it says she's the city that sits over the, the kings of the earth. So she has a lot of power. She's the number one empire at the end of time. She's a nation that possesses a form of Christianity that is fraudulent, but also that is very powerful and tells the world what to do. When we look at all the kingdoms of the world, it's not hard to know that the United States of America is an empire. We're an empire. We have over 700 bases. We have a presence all over the world. We tell the world what to do. We are the strong man. When we went into Iraq under George Bush and took possession of it, it also solidified that the United States was then the one that was the keeper of the Babylonian baton in the end of time. Because Babylon has always been the baton that has been passed around through the ages in different empires. When we go back to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had the great city of Babylon, and that's where the children of Israel were kept in captivity. And then Persia took possession of Babylon. So Babylon was in Persia, and then Alexander the Great took possession of it, 
When he got to Babylon, he loved it. So when Alexander saw it, he didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay there. And that's where he ended up dying. There's a debate in history over whether he was sick or poisoned, but nevertheless, he got sick and he died in Babylon. So Babylon is a baton that gets passed through the ages by different kingdoms. Fast forward to the end times, the United States of America tells Iraq what to do. They're not independent. They can't do what they want. You see, folks, when we lay this on the table, we have America, the end time empire that is Christian, quote unquote, and wants to become great with the seven mountain mandate and wants to recreate the constitution to turn America into a Christian nationalist nation so that they can be adorned with holiness and confidence. They've achieved some kind of holy assignment from God. That is exactly the attitude that we read about when we look at Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17, because she says, I will never be a widow. I will never see anything bad. I'm great. But the problem is she was doing this without Jesus. Mystery Babylon is missing Jesus. Right now, as it stands in America, there is a movement taking place of Christian nationalism that has MAGA as the spirit behind it. MAGA, the satanic word from hell. MAGA, make America great, or in other words, make Babylon great again. That word MAGA represents witchcraft and Satanism, and we talked about it in the previous program. It's the level six of the Church of Satan, and she wears that cap on her head. A lot of Christians wear that cap on their forehead, which is blasphemy, and that's exactly what God says. She has blasphemy. And this woman, or in other words, the United States, Mystery Babylon, is sitting on seven mountains. You see, folks, how this is all fitting? The seven mountains are the fulfillment of what we're reading right here. And because she's sitting on them, this is a Christian movement. It is a form of Christianity that is diabolical and confused. It has Satan in it. It has demonic beliefs in it. And we started this program with proof of that. Charlie Kirk calls himself a Christian and he went into a Christian church and he told them that the day after the election, they need to go kill their neighbors and do a revolution, just like they did in 1776. If there are some folks that say, no, nah, that was just symbolic, what he meant. He was just talking from a symbolic. No, he wasn't because I have proven it over and over. The rhetoric that is coming from these people is violence. It is death. It's murder. It's shedding blood and trying to purge the land with the arm of the flesh instead of with the Holy Ghost. I showed you this in a previous program. Michael Flynn got the church to pray to the seven rays. Now we have this woman, Mystery Babylon, who blasphemes God and claims to be God's spiritual nation, but instead she's following Lucifer and his seven rays, which are the seven mountains. A moment ago, I made a comment. I said that Mystery Babylon and today's MAGA minions have the forehead of a whore. That comes from the Bible, folks. In the book of Jeremiah, you can turn there or write this down. When Jeremiah was proclaiming judgment on Israel, on Jerusalem, he was speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So his words were from God. And he says in Jeremiah 3, verse 3. Now, chapter 3 is about Israel being divorced about God divorcing her because she goes after foreign gods. And let's go ahead and start with verse 1. They say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers. Now, this is God talking to Israel, to Jerusalem. He starts off by saying that she was his wife. She's his bride. But instead, now, because she has played the harlot with many lovers... She thinks that she can go do that and then just come right back to him. You were my wife, my bride, but you went off and committed adultery with others. So now you're a harlot. Verse 2. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see. Where have you not lain with men? By the road you have sat for them. And you have like an Arabian in the wilderness. And you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Verse 3. Therefore the showers have been withheld. So drought was going to come, and there has been no latter rain. Now, this is a message for the end times as well. And here it is, folks. You have had a harlot's forehead, and you refuse to be ashamed. So the reference to the people of God, Israel, in the Old Testament, was that Israel was supposed to be his wife, his bride, but they went wayward, so they were no longer his bride, and they turned into a harlot or a whore. You have the forehead of a whore, he says to them. 
And because of that, God's going to bring drought. Now, when we look at the prophecies against Mystery Babylon in Jeremiah 50 and 51, it says the same thing. At the end of time, whoever this entity is, which is America, it says in there that they're going to have drought. That means that we can expect for there to be drought here in America. We can expect rain to be held back. And as the days progress into further evil, if Donald Trump comes into power, do I say if he comes into power or when he does? Folks, I hope he doesn't come. I hope he goes away. I hope that this doesn't happen or that it's prolonged. Well, Nathan, if he doesn't come into power, that means you just made all this up. No, it doesn't. It means that he was still a form of Antichrist, but we're not done with his family because we have Donald Jr. and we also have Barron. This can go on for a while or it's going to be under him. This means, folks, that for the next decade or two, we have to still be watching if it's not Donald Trump. But back to what I was saying. America's Mystery Babylon, we see even more of the identity confirmed right here. And because it is, we're going to see drought, which means we're going to see fires. That's exactly what's been happening already. But it's going to get worse. But back to the harlot's forehead. When we look at the woman in Revelation, it says that on her forehead that she's a harlot, that she thought she was great. So the harlot of Babylon has the forehead of a whore in Revelation 17. She does. And if the harlot of Babylon that has the forehead of a whore is actually the United States of America, then that means that when this image becomes complete, when this transformation, this morphing that is happening to America right now is complete, then that means that America will have the forehead of a whore and it will only be because the residents of America who believed this, that she had attained some kind of royalty, the seven mountain mandate, the false damnable heresies, are the ones that are doing it. Do you see it, folks? And why does she have the forehead of a whore? It's because she refuses to be ashamed. Old Testament Israel. We read that in Jeremiah 3.3. 3. Fast forward to the United States. Same thing. The United States Christian nationalistic form of government that they want to bring will have no shame. And that's exactly the way they behave. When we look at the Congress people, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Bobard, Matt Gates. Mike Johnson, all those guys, Jim Jordan, they are full of anger and vitriol and hatred and malice. They speak with hatred. They speak with anger. They have no compassion. They always vote down any bill that will help others. And then when we look at the clerics, the warlocks behind the pulpit that are pushing MAGA and the Seven Mountain Lie, you have Greg Locke, you have Lance Wellnow and Rick Joyner. The pink-haired lady, Cat Kerr, or whatever her name is, they're all full of themselves. They have no shame. So when we look at Mystery Babylon and Revelation, we see a snapshot of how things are, the pride and the arrogance in her words. Now, conversely, when we look at Aaron the high priest, he had a gold inscription on his head. God also mentioned that back in Exodus, when it's describing the garments of Aaron. God said, Moses, you are to make a medallion made out of solid gold, and inscribe into that medallion, holiness unto the Lord. And put a blue cord on each side of it and tie it to Aaron's forehead with a blue cord. So Jesus, again, there it is again, blue, Jesus. It is only through him that we can have holiness. Ladies and gentlemen, it is here. It was there the whole time. So when the Holy Spirit told Allison about this, that the bride of Christ is in competition with the whore of Babylon, and that these people are actually contenders for the faith some of them are flaky christians and the others are the remnant so the whore of babylon and the bride of christ are the people that go to church unfortunately there's a movement in babylon america that is confusing people with this heresy of the seven mountains to climb these mountains and when we go to jeremiah chapter 50 which is a reference to end time america write this down folks jeremiah chapter 50 verse 6 it's describing america look what it says my people have been a lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. Do you see it, folks? The false shepherds, the Nar preachers in these end times in Mystery Babylon, these false prophets, these ones who have brought mixture and new age and the words of Satan and devils to the church are now leading God's people astray. And they have turned them away on the mountains. There's the mountains again, the seven mountains. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. And as we proceed into further ruin, Babylon USA is going to become even more defiant. 
they are the land of, if you go down to verse 21, look what it says. They're going to become more defiant, for they are the land of Mirathim, which means the land of people of double rebellion and bitterness. They are doubly rebellious, and they are and shall be the land of Pekod, which is the land of punishment. Maga USA is not going to go unpunished because she has the forehead of a whore with blasphemous Maga inscribed on her forehead. Ladies and gentlemen, Maga is arrogant. It's proud. It's rebellious because they have installed the man of sin as their leader. And they think that they're going to make the land great with the man of sin, with the Antichrist. But instead, they are bringing punishment. Because Babylon is the land of Pekod, like verse 21 says, and they're the land of punishment. Ladies and gentlemen, God is going to take vengeance against the seven mountain mandate because it is a direct affront against his temple, which is supposed to be the seat of your heart. The seat of your heart, folks. And that's the other crime against God that Maga is doing and that this end time church is doing. They do not understand the tabernacle. They do not understand the shadow of the tabernacle. But when we look at the condition of Magalan, in other words, in Revelation 17 and 18, it doesn't have blue. It just has scarlet linen and purple. It's missing Jesus. And the reason for that is because they're trying to create a tabernacle on earth instead of in our hearts. Their preachers do not talk about the tabernacle in our heart, the temple of God that resides within us. They don't talk about that. If you were to go to the sewer, the ether of the seven mountain teaching, of Lance Wow now, he gets a whiteboard on the stage and he starts drawing the seven mountains and explaining the heresy to the audience. And when he does, he says one of the mountains is government and the other's media and entertainment, family and the others. And he says that the thing that God wants us to do is to claim these mountains, these fears of culture, these fears of influence. We have to take them over and we have to do it with gusto and determination. And when we do take possession of these and install our leadership in all of these areas, then we will build the tabernacle on top of the seven mountains. Which again, is a misrepresentation of the temple of God. It's about the temple, folks. The temple. And because the people of God no longer understand the temple, God is going to bring wrath because of that. That's one of the reasons for his wrath. And it says that in Jeremiah 50, 28. It's in there. After the, the rapture that's coming, the harvest, the gathering, when we disappear in Revelation 14, 14, after that, the bowls are going to occur, the bowl judgments, the wrath of God, and he's going to burn the whole earth up, which will then be the time when Babylon gets burned up. So Babylon will get destroyed during the wrath, after the rapture. And when that happens, God is going to raise up an enemy to destroy America, Babylon. And he tells us who it is. It's Persia, which today is known as Iran and an assembly, an alliance of other nations that are going to help him, which will probably be Russia. And we can find that in Jeremiah 50, 28. It says, The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, Persia, for his plan is against Babylon to destroy it. Why? Here it is, folks. Because the vengeance of the Lord and the vengeance for his temple. Because they didn't understand the tabernacle of God. They didn't understand that the temple of God resided within us. And then they went in and committed harlotries against God's people to the point where the people allowed an idol to replace Jesus that was in their hearts. And that's exactly what we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when it says, before the gathering, we're going to have the great falling away, and then the man of sin will arrive. And that is the guy who will then go into the temple and claim to be God. It's not the temple of in Israel, folks. This is the temple of our hearts. It is about the tabernacle of our hearts. And the lordship of Jesus that should reside in our hearts. But that is being taken away. And for that reason, the wrath of God is going to come. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why I was saying a moment ago that the reason for the tribulation period is a test. Do you see, folks? Now it's plain and clear. It's before all of us. The reason for the tribulation is so that the church can be tested and so that they can have a chance to choose the one that they want to follow. And the choice that God is using is Donald Trump, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness who wants to sit in the seat of your heart. Glory to Jesus because he has given us this knowledge that was in scripture. It was in there the whole time. Folks, this revelation was in there the whole time. This knowledge, this rhema was in the Bible the whole time. And I know that there's a lot. I know I gave you a lot, 
But in summary, we are in the time of testing, ladies and gentlemen. And if you are a Trump follower, you're being tested to see if you're going to follow what the Bible says or go along with the crowd. Are you going to go along with peer pressure or the words of God? Are you going to go along with the desires of the flesh, the excitement of the flesh? The seven mountain categories are not found in the Bible. And if they're not found in the Bible, how can these people try to take over the world or destroy America and burn the Constitution and try to make their own version of Christianity when it's not even in the Bible? And if it's not in the Bible, that means we're either adding or taking away. Which one is it? They're adding a new prophecy. They're adding new revelation. And they're taking away the tabernacle from God. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, if we were to look at the ministry of Jesus, I've shared this before. When Jesus began his ministry, one of the first things he did was he went into the temple and he cleansed it. That's how he started his ministry. If we fast forward three and a half years to before he was arrested and, and killed, he did the same thing. Did you know that, folks? He did it twice. He did it at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, which means when Jesus shows up in our lives, he wants to cleanse our temple. That's what happens when we initially repent and we're born again. But the cleansing never stops because even at the very end, he has zeal for his temple. And he goes in there and he cleanses it. And if we were to go and read what it says in the reference to him cleansing the temple... It says that he went in and he overturned the tables of the money changers of those who were buying and selling in the temple. Buying and selling. When we go to Revelation and we see the beast, it says that they had to get a mark and they couldn't buy and sell unless they had a mark. Now it's interesting that we have the same reference. We have the temple in the account of Jesus. We have buying and selling mentions. In Revelation, we have the choice of honoring a fake Jesus, an anti-Jesus, an anti-Christ. And to be able to buy and sell during his reign, there needs to be a loyalty test, a loyalty commitment to him. So you see it, folks? It's matching up with the Bible. Folks, we are in the tribulation. And if the worst case scenario occurs, and if there is a coup to the United States of America in the next few months, then after that, you're not going to be able to listen to this program. You're not going to be able to listen to me bring this warning. It's going to be gone. And if you didn't study up to that point, and the YouTube channel's gone, what reference are you going to use if you didn't write the notes down in your Bible? If you didn't have it highlighted? If you didn't take it upon yourself to, to study this? And that's why I say over and over, make notes in your Bible. Highlight verses that I mentioned. And also take notes with a pen and paper. If you haven't listened to the other programs in this series, I want to encourage you to do that, to take notes, to download the YouTubes, to save them, and get a hold of them. Get a hold of the information because you're going to need this information when it gets real dark in the future. Because darkness is coming, folks. A great darkness is approaching. I know this was a long program, but I hope and pray, ladies and gentlemen, that this hits home. The end times, they're about you being tested. That's what it's about. And we're not going to pass a test if we don't have the right biblical knowledge. And I can't say that enough, my friends. All right, folks, where well, I'm going to go ahead and end this program now because it's pretty long. But I want to ask you to share this, listen to it again and again. Subscribe. We need to make this channel huge. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And also hit the like button. Also, you see our address up there on the screen. Folks, remember us. Remember Watchman's Cry. Remember this ministry. Remember Nathan Leal. Pray for us. Help us continue this work. Hold my hand because by doing this, we are helping the bride of Christ get ready for the wedding feast. All right, folks, there's the address. Watchman's Cry, P.O. Box 157, Priest River, Idaho, 83856. There's also a link to Venmo and Cash App and also PayPal in the description below. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, stay vigilant, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.